Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning into The Ordinary Filmmaker. Today's video is all about how to film the moon. So without further ado, let's cue some footage and get right into it. I'm shooting with a Canon EOS R5, but you don't need such an expensive camera. Essentially what you do want is a camera though that's capable of giving you detailed 4K video, which you're going to need to capture the craters as you see here. Now the moon is shimmering a little bit, and I'll get into that in a little bit and explain why that is. But let's, let's talk about equipment first. So again, a good camera that can give you 4K video really, really helps. Uh, it doesn't have to be a full frame camera. In fact, a APS-C camera is going to give you a crop, which is really helpful in this situation. The lens that I'm using is an RF 800mm f11. It's fixed at f11. And I'm also using the 2 times extender, and I have not cropped in and post in any way whatsoever. This is exactly as it came out of the lens. I did some minor tweaking in Final Cut. I tweaked the brightness a little bit. I tweaked the shadows because I shot this in C-Log. That's 10-bit 422, so I get a lot of control over the highlights and the shadows. And it's looking pretty good. And I also applied a black and white filter to it. The moon actually isn't normally this color, but what you see is when you watch on television and movies, you quite often are given this view, which is basically a black and white version of the moon. So let's go back to our equipment. 800 millimeters is a great focal length. The, the longer you can go, the better. You need a minimum of 400 millimeters, and with 400 millimeters, the moon is going to take up probably about a quarter of the screen here. And if you're using an APS-C, you can add a 50% or 60% crop to that, which gives you about 1,200 millimeters on an 800 millimeter, or about 600 millimeters on a 400 millimeter. And if you can apply an extender, like a 2 times extender or a 1.4 extender, well, that allows you to zoom in more. So the effective millimeter range that I'm getting here, when you take into account the 800 millimeter, the 2 times extender, that I'm shooting in 4K, 30 frames per second, in cropped mode, I've got 2,560 millimeters equivalent. Now, I could have shot in 8K, and I actually shot Mars the other night in 8K, which allows me to go up to about 3,200 millimeters, but I didn't really notice any improvement in detail compared to what I shot in 4K in cropped mode. This setup works just as well if I was shooting the planets. So here's a shot of Jupiter that I shot earlier this summer. Jupiter was pretty high up in the sky, and you can see I don't get any of that shimmering. So let's address the shimmering here. When you're shooting celestial bodies like the Moon, Jupiter, Saturn, or even Mars, what you want to do is wait till they're pretty high up in the sky, because if you don't, you're going to get that shimmering that we saw earlier with the Moon. And the reason for that is the ground is quite warm. It's warmer than the sky, so you get all that heat coming out of the ground. And even though, yes, it's December, you're getting an awful lot of atmospheric distortion due to heat and other factors. So you want to shoot with your celestial bodies, like the Moon, straight overhead. Your eyes aren't fooling you. This is a picture of the Moon during the daylight hours. I was very fortunate. Uh, the beautiful sunny skies right now. There isn't a cloud in sight. And I can't say the same for last night. There wasn't supposed to be many clouds, but by about 8 o'clock at night, the sky was completely overcast, and it didn't lighten up till probably sometime long after I was sound asleep. But if you notice here, look at this uh, video of the moon. You can see that there's none of that shimmering going on. None whatsoever. Now, I didn't leave my camera out here for several hours for it to cool down. It was only out for about a couple of minutes to cool down. And this is going back to what I said earlier. If you want to capture the moon without any sort of shimmering, without that heat island effect, you want to make sure it's pretty high up in the sky. Now, it wasn't directly overhead, but it was around like 2, 3 o'clock. And the results are pretty good, wouldn't you say? It's very, very sharp, very detailed, at least as detailed as it can be for daylight hours. Now, if I want to capture Jupiter or any of the other celestial bodies, any stars during the day, it wouldn't be possible, not without a really, really expensive telescope and a huge budget to go along with it. Let's go back and talk about software settings. So we talked about hardware. We talked about that I used a, a camera that has detailed 4K. That's important. You want a lens that allows you to go at least 400 millimeters, but 800 millimeters with an extender is very helpful. And if you can shoot in a cropped mode, or if you've got an APS-C camera, like a good APS-C camera, even an M6 Mark II, a Sony a6100, um, you know, any camera that's got a decent crop is really going to help you here and give you really good results. And I also recommend shooting in C-Log or V-Log or S-Log. Shoot in Log because what that will allow you to do is have a little bit more control over the highlights as well as the shadows, and that's very, very handy. But once you get into post, there's not a lot that needs to be done. The aspect ratio, everything you see, is directly out of the camera. 
here's where I did make some changes. I made some slight changes to the highlights and the shadows, and I added an effect to make it black and white. Now, the daylight, I didn't do that, but this view of the moon that you saw earlier on, it's quite often that in movies and TV shows, they give it a black and white look, but the moon actually has a bit more of a grayer look to it. I like that black and white look, so I made that change. I stripped away the audio, um, and that's pretty well it. There's not a lot you need to do in post. The Canon R5 has IBIS. The image you're going to get is going to be a little bit jerky, and that's just because of the sensitivity of shooting over such a long distance, the vibrations you're getting from the ground, from the camera, from the tripod, from Ren, from, from the entire environment. By turning stabilization on, it'll make it rock steady and completely take care of that for you. And speaking of making it rock steady, the other thing that's very important is having a really good tripod. You want one that's heavy. You want one that's not going to blow around or move around in the wind. And I don't mean like it's going to be thrown about, but you want a lens that's sturdy enough that if a wind does pick up, it doesn't cause it to vibrate. The one I've got is a Manfrotto. It's got the 504X head and the aluminum tripod, allowing me to really anchor the tripod so when the camera's on top, it's not going anywhere. And because it's a video tripod, I'm able to pan and tilt quite effectively. If you've had a telescope, it's not as effective as a telescope because it isn't made for those minute adjustments. But as I was able to slightly tighten and loosen um, the drag on the pan and the tilt, I was able to get the moon and other celestial objects such as Mars, which is quite small in the night sky, locked into the frame quite easily. And with just enough drag, if the moon moved and I need to restart the shot, I could easily reposition the moon without a lot of effort. So having a really good tripod makes a huge difference. The biggest takeaway that I can say about shooting the moon though is, is just getting out there and trying it. Be willing to make mistakes, don't be afraid. Uh, the first time I got out and shot the moon, things went very, very well. It couldn't have gone any better for me. But then the other night when I went out there with the 800 millimeter and the two times extender, I thought everything was gonna go really well. I thought everything looked great. You see, when you're looking through this tiny little viewfinder here that's, you know, an inch across, or the LCD, which is about three inches, it, it doesn't really give you enough space to really tell if things are in focus. You're shooting 4K video. And that shimmering, that shimmering that we saw earlier on in this video, it looked perfectly good through the LCD. Because I did check it out, I did test it out, and everything looked great. But, as you obviously saw, it didn't work out as well. And I should have known better, and once I saw it, I go, okay, this is most likely because of heat coming off the houses, because there's a lot of houses between the horizon and where the moon is. And it's also December, so the ground hasn't frozen, so there's still an awful lot of heat raising up from the ground. So as I was shooting right across, you know, we've got all these houses, there's a bit of a dip in the valley, there's all these houses, heat's coming up, and I'm cutting through atmosphere. Now, if I go up, after about a kilometer or two, the atmosphere isn't very dense at all. It's very, very thin. But if I shoot this way, I'm cutting through hundreds of kilometers or a hundred a kilometer of atmosphere. So that heat haze effect really, really builds up. So you want to make sure that the, the, the stars, not the stars, unless you're doing photography, this is all about filmmaking, but if you're shooting the moon, if you're shooting Jupiter, shooting Saturn, I was out here last night and I got Mars, it looked pretty good, but you know, it's about similar size to the moon, but a lot further away. So it still was more or less a little bit of a ball, not a lot of detail. I didn't see any canales, which would have been nice, but I really wasn't expecting to be able to see any. Um, the, the, real, the real thing that I'm looking forward to coming up this month is around the 21st, and that's where we see the convergence of Jupiter and Saturn. And I'm really excited about that. I was hoping to get, a, I was hoping to shoot them last night. They're pretty close to each other, and they're right over here, and I found a perfect spot for it. But when I looked in the night sky, I didn't bother to see where they were trending. Right now, the moon is trending this way, coming over like this, and it's just setting now. Jupiter and Saturn, they're trending down this way here. So um, I'm going to have to wait a few more weeks to be able to get those guys a little bit better. But I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, apps like the night sky, I think, are terrific. I can't remember if I spent anything on that. Uh, if I did, it certainly wasn't very expensive. But it's one of those tools that you really, really want. And you want to get an iPad or some sort of tablet because you've got a larger space and that's really handy too. And also you can remote control your camera through that as well. I know that Camera Connect, you can do that as well. You can do that with a Canon Camera Connect app. But yeah, just get out there, try things out. Uh, before you shoot tons and tons of stuff, 
shoot a little bit, take, see how it looks in an iPad, or try it out on your computer. Because again, the viewfinder and the LCD aren't gonna give you enough detail, even if you have 2010 vision, it's not gonna be good enough. So test things out, try it out, experiment. Um, I can't remember if I said this earlier on the video, um, but as far as your settings you wanna go for the lenses, uh, when you're using a super telephoto like the 800 millimeter with a two times extender, you're, you really don't have a lot of choice. Uh, what I did is I set the shutter to 1 60th, which I do for all of my videos. Uh, the f-stop was at f11 without the extender, f22 with the extender. And at f22, I set the ISO to 400. You can go 375 or 350. I set it at 400. And of course, at f11, you're going to be down around 200. And I got some pretty good results. There wasn't a lot of noise. There's just something about shooting the night sky. It brings out that inner child. And for me, I was always a big fan of Star Trek because Star Trek was about exploring. It was about building a, a picture of humanity that left things better than they were when we started. And so that kind of got me interested in the stars. And about 20 years ago, when, was, um, when I was in my 30s, I got myself a telescope and it was a lot of fun. But I'll be honest with you, what I'm able to get with the R5 is better than what I was able to do with that telescope. And with that telescope, I wasn't even able to hook up a camera. So get out there, wear some warm gloves, wear a nice warm hat. Uh, my hat's in the wash, so I took my son's. Cute, isn't it? Yeah, the eye autofocus is still working, I can see. Um, but yeah, be warm, take some tasty snacks. I'm planning on doing a shoot with the village mayor soon, and he's gonna get some tasty Japanese beef. He says it's very expensive, I said, come on, Tim, how? You only live once, so we'll get some tasty snacks, we'll get some nice drinks, maybe some plum wine, and we'll see. No, it's not a date. It's If you've never done astrophotography, if you've ever done, filmed the moon or the stars or the planets, it's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of waiting, and it's cold, so you want to be warm, you want to have some nice refreshments, and just enjoy it. I find it awe-inspiring. I find it exciting. Um, um, it's almost like soul searching kind of stuff, um, but that's me. Maybe that's a little corny for you. So suffice it to say, that's it for now. Thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win the Cinco Lav S6E and M3 shotgun microphones. I'll be awarding those two prizes to one lucky viewer once the channel reaches 100,000, once the channel reaches 20,000 subscribers. And then for every 10,000 or so, or so, so, my mouth is freezing. <laughs> for every 10,000 or so subscribers after that, I'll be offering up a new and better prizes. And I already have an idea on what prize I'm gonna do for 30,000. And then of course, once the channel reaches 100,000 subscribers, I'll be giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera. And on that bombshell, thanks for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon.